Memorial Day, as you know, has been set aside to remember those and to honor those who have died. It is observed so that we, the living, will not forget those who have fallen asleep in death, those who are no longer among us. There comes a time, however, after several generations when those who have fallen asleep in death generally really are forgotten. Most of us probably knew no further back in our families than our grandparents. And our grandparents in turn knew their grandparents, but we don't know them. I was thinking just the other day, as a grandfather, I have grandchildren. They know me, but they don't know my grandfather or my grandmother. I knew them. I remember them very well, and I love them dearly. But my grandchildren, they would be strangers to them. They never saw them. They never knew them. And so those generations have passed, and while I remember my grandparents and my grandchildren know me, they don't know my grandparents. And so the years and the generations go by, and the dead gradually are forgotten. We know, for example, in Ecclesiastes, the writer of this book re remembers this, and he speaks about this in verse 4 of chapter 9. I'm reading from the NIV. He says, anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even the memory of them is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. Now, the writer of Ecclesiastes is talking about this life, this age, we might say. And as long as this age lasts, those who are dead have no part. They simply are forgotten, he says. Not only do they know nothing, but the generations to follow forget about them and know nothing or very little of those who have died. The memory of them is forgotten. The title of our message this morning is Our God remembers. We the living may forget, and we do. All of us seem to have better forgetters than we have memories at times. I know I do, and it gets worse as I get older, unfortunately. But I'd like to look with you for a moment this morning, before we look at how infinitely and how intricately God remembers, let's remind ourselves of how easily we forget. I'd like to go back to the book of Genesis to begin in the 40th chapter. We have an interesting account here. To me, the life of Joseph has always been one of the most interesting in the whole Bible. This young man who was looked down upon by his brothers, they didn't understand him. They even planned to kill him at one time. Finally, they settled for selling him into slavery in Egypt. Of course, God had his hand on Joseph's life. Joseph realized this, and he served God faithfully where he was. One of the places where he ended up was in jail in Egypt on false accusation. We won't go into all that story. Falsely accused and thrown into jail. You might think, well, God's forgotten me. You could be very discouraged in such a situation. We read here that while Joseph was in jail, two of the king's or Pharaoh's servants also were thrown into jail, his cupbearer and his baker. They had offended the king in some way, and he put them in prison. And while they were in prison, they each had a dream, a very remarkable, strange dream. And they were quite perplexed 
because they didn't understand the meaning of their dream. And the dream apparently was so impressive that they felt it must have a meaning. It must have some significance. And so Joseph was told about this. And in verse 8, we read that Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said to him, In my dream I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup in his hand. This is what it means, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well with you, remember me. Remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. For I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even, even here, I've done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat away your flesh. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. But please notice the very last verse of the chapter, a short one. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. He forgot him. How human, how typical of us human beings, even though Joseph, in fact, had done him a great favor, had given him hope, in fact, had interpreted correctly his dream through the power of God, yet the baker forgot. And I think perhaps the Lord may have had a hand in that, as what turns out later. Nevertheless, the forgetfulness, I think, is interesting because it is so typical of human beings. <clears throat> in the book of Exodus, in the 17th chapter, we have an example that I think needs to be on our minds regarding the way God works with us. Exodus 17. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried to the, out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. If you just go back a chapter or two, you'll find that God not only had given them water before this, he had sweetened some water that they had come upon in the desert. He had also begun feeding them with manna day by day. Even that very day that they were saying that, they were eating the manna that God had provided. Not, they did not come to Moses and say, Moses, we're thirsty. Would you pre, pre, uh, please pray to the Lord that he will provide water to us? No, they come, came grumbling and complaining and 
almost ready to stone Moses because they were thirsty and there was no water at that particular place. Why? Because they had forgotten, almost deliberately it would seem, that God had been taking care of them, that he had been providing for them. They didn't remember this. They put it away from their memory, almost as though they deliberately were ignoring what God was doing for them. I wonder if at times we do this. I know I have done it and caught myself doing it. Not too long ago either. Where it's so easy to forget what God does and has done for us. How he has protected us. How he has led us through the wilderness of life. At times it seems a wilderness. And he has provided in even ways that we could hardly fathom at the time. And yet we will get to that place where we will complain and gripe and grumble and be almost ready to say to God, well, what kind of a God are you? Just as they're saying, in effect, that God wasn't visibly there, but Moses was, so they're taking it out on Moses. But their attitude is really betrayed what their attitude toward God is in what they're doing and saying here to Moses. Almost as though if they could stone God, they would. But Moses is the convenient target. He's the one that's there that they can see. Do we forget God's mercies in times of trial? And we do have times of trial. There are times when we are perplexed. There are times when we wonder what we should do or where the Lord is even. We get to those places at times. And then I think we need to remind ourselves how God has been so kind and gracious to us. And he will be. And he is if we only will look for that. One of the saddest, to me at least, saddest accounts in the Bible of human forgetfulness is one that is found in Second Chronicles. <clears throat> we have here a story, an account in the 22nd chapter of Second Chronicles of a certain king of Judah, king named Ahaziah. Ahaziah was not a good king. He was a wicked king. And when he died, his mother, whose name was Athaliah, took over the government. She was a very domineering woman, apparently. She determined that she was going to be the absolute ruler. And in order to do that, she killed all her grandchildren and the step-grandchildren that she could get her hands on, all the royal descendants that were alive. Now that her son was killed, she had all the other sons of the king, either her grandchildren or sons by other wives, put to death. She wanted to be the boss, so she had them all put to death. However, there was one child that she didn't know about, a little baby, whose name was Joash. And Joash's sister, who was married to the priest, Jehoiada, hid this little baby, and Athaliah didn't know about him. Nobody else that was on her side knew about him. And so this little child survived, this little Joash survived. And that is given, the whole story is in the 23rd chapter. And Jehoiada raised this little boy in the temple, in the temple chambers, and they didn't know anything about, the, the queen didn't know anything about this. Finally, when the child was about seven years old and could be revealed to certain leaders in the government that he was alive and was the lawful heir to the throne, Jehoiada told them. And they decided that they were going to put this lawful ruler, child though he was, on the throne and get rid of Athaliah. Probably by that time, she was pretty well hated by everybody. She sound, From the account given in Scripture, she sounded like a very dominating and wicked and 
miserable person. Anyway, when Athaliah heard that they had crowned Joash king, she came in running and yelling, treason, treason, in verse 13 of chapter 23. She considered this treason against her. So we read that she was arrested by the soldiers and she was put to death, but not in the temple. We read in verse 16 that Jehoiada then made a covenant that he and the people and the king, this young boy, would be the Lord's people. All the people went to the temple of Baal and tore it down. That was Athaliah's temple. She worshipped Baal. They smashed the altars and idols and killed Matan, the priest of Baal, in front of the altars. And then we read that Joash, if we go on in the account, grows up. He is led and taught by Jehoiada. But finally, Jehoiada dies. And it's very interesting to read and very sad to read what happens. The 17th verse of chapter 24. And Jehoiada lived a long time. He lived to be 130, we read. But in verse 17, it says, After the death of Jehoiada, the officials of Judah came and paid homage to the king. And he listened to them. They abandoned the temple of the Lord, the God of their fathers, and worshipped Asherah poles and idols. Because of their guilt, God's anger came upon Judah and Jerusalem. Although the Lord sent prophets to the people to bring them back to him, and though they testified against them, they would not listen. Now, Joash has grown up by this time. He's a mature man. Notice this, verse 20. Then the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, son of Jehoiada the priest. He stood before the temple and said, This is what God says. Why do you disobey the Lord's commands? You will not prosper. Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has forsaken you. But they plotted against him, and by order of the king, they stoned him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. King Joash did not remember the kindness Zechariah's father, Jehoiada, had shown him, but killed his son, who said as he lay dying, May the Lord see this and call you to account. Here, in effect, is Joash's own stepbrother, in a, in a way, because Jehoiada, remember, had raised Joash from babyhood. And Joash's sister was Jehoiada's wife. And the mother, presumably, of this son, Zechariah, who is now being put to death at the king's command. Because Zechariah dared to point out to the king and the people that they were forsaking God and turning to idols. And so we read that Joash forgot. He just simply put it out of his mind. All that Zechariah's father and mother had done for him had caused him to survive when all the other children were killed, had raised him and seen to it ultimately that he received his rightful throne. How convenient to forget because Joash wanted to serve idols instead of the living and true God. <clears throat> it's interesting that when we get to the New Testament, we find frequent admonitions to remember, to remember what God has done. For example, in 1 Timothy 4, 6, the apostle says, the NIV says, if you point these things out to the brothers, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truths of the faith. King James says, if you put them in remembrance, put the brethren in remembrance, point them out to them so they remember these things, because it's so easy to forget. 2 Timothy 2.14. Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Keep reminding them, he says. 
Don't stop reminding the brethren. You know, very seldom is anything new ever said in any pulpit in this land. Things that you've known, things that you've heard time and time again. And yet, we need to be reminded. Peter, in his second epistle, in the first chapter in 12, the 12th verse says, So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them, and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. It says, I know that even though you know these things, even though you've heard them time and time again, said you still need to be reminded. You still need to have your memory refreshed. Human beings as we are, with such uh, easy forgetters and such hard memories at times. Hard to remember. Yes, man does forget, and we all find ourselves in this predicament at times. Hopefully not willful forgetting. Although we see that Joash must have done some willful, willful forgetting. In contrast to all that, our God remembers. Thank God he remembers. I'd like to turn to the book of Malachi and notice a precious aspect of his remembrance. Malachi, the third chapter in verses 16 and 17. It says, then those who feared the Lord talked with each other. And the Lord listened and heard. Do you know that the Lord overhears your conversations? And think how pleased he is when those conversations are glorifying to him. When you are talking, perhaps, with a fellow believer, you are rehearsing the things that God has done. This morning in our Sunday school class, we were discussing and rehearsing some of the things that God has done, that he has done, that give him praise and glory that he richly deserves because he's done these things. So we read here that the, those who feared the Lord talked with each other. And the Lord listened. He was listening in this morning. You may be sure as we sat around that table discussing what God has done, he was listening. He heard all of that. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty, in the day when I make up my treasured possessions. I will spare them just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. God is making up a record book. Did you know that? That record book contains the names of those who fear him, who honor him, who speak of him one to another, and who want to be known as his children. Those people are going to be his, he says, in the day when he makes up his treasured possession, and he will spare them, spare them some things that are coming on this earth, spare them from the wrath of God which is going to be poured out on this earth someday when Jesus comes to render the indignation of Almighty God. We don't like to talk too much about that theme. It's kind of a scary theme. But Paul says, of Jesus that he delivers us from the wrath to come. <clears throat> Remember the that John the Baptist warned the Pharisees who were coming to his baptism. He, he said, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth fruits therefore worthy, a, appropriate to repentance. So there is a wrath to come. But those who are his, he says, he will spare them in that day because they are his treasured possession. God remembers and he will remember his people and he remembers them now and he will remember them in that day. In Hebrews the sixth chapter in the tenth verse 
<clears throat> we read this of God's remembrance. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you've helped his people and continue to help them. God's not going to forget that. He doesn't forget what you do for others. He knows. Jesus said, if you give so much as a cup of cold water in my name because of being a disciple, that person who does that will not lose his reward. That means somebody's remembering that you did that. God remembers that. He knows what you're doing or what you're not doing. He knows that. In 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, in the last verse, that wonderful resurrection chapter that we love so much, I love the way it finishes. He says in verse 58, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move, move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You know this, he says. And if you don't know it, we better know it. Because whatever you do, because you love him and you want to serve him, it's not in vain because he knows, he remembers, and he will reward you as a child of his who serves him with a pure heart out of your love for him. And finally, we'd like to notice that he remembers those who have fallen asleep in death. We read in Psalm 116, verse 15, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, his holy ones. If not even a sparrow can fall without your father, as Jesus said, even a sparrow can't die without God knowing it. And he says, ye are of much more value than many sparrows, he said. How much more then is, there, is it precious in the sight of the Lord, the death of those who are his, who have fallen asleep in Jesus, and who therefore are remembered because of that. Remember once Abraham said, when Sarah died. He wanted to buy a place to bury Sarah. And he went to buy this grave site and he said to the person from whom he bought it, he said, let me buy this field that I may bury my dead out of my sight. That's found in Genesis 23, 4. I want to bury my dead out of my sight. Obviously, he couldn't keep her around anymore. She had died. She must be buried. She was out of his sight. We have an old saying, out of sight, out of mind. But you know, it's never out of God's sight. We read there in our scripture reading, Kirby read in Psalm 139, that even if I am in Sheol, the NIV said the depths, but the Hebrew word is Sheol, the condition and place of death, even if I am there, the psalmist says, Thou art there. God sees his people who are asleep in Sheol, who are dead, because he intends to raise them from the dead. It reminds me of that wonderful scripture in Romans 4, 17. Speaking of Abraham, <clears throat> it says of him, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our Father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. He gives life to the dead and gives things that are not the dead, in other words. Remember in the scripture it speaks of the dead as those who are not. Are not. You'll find that all through the Old Testament. It'll say, my brother is not meaning my brother is dead. He's, he's gone. He's not anymore. They are not. And yet, in God's sight, they are. Because remember, Jesus told the Sadducees, those who did not believe in the resurrection, 
He said, to God they are alive because he plans to raise them. Let's look at that just a minute in closing here. It's in Luke. <clears throat> Luke's account in the 20th chapter as he concludes his discussion with those skeptics, the Sadducees, those who were so doubtful, so dubious of God raising the dead. <clears throat> Luke 20, verse 37. He says, In the account of the bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise. For he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For to him, all are alive. To him, not to us, but to him, all are alive. Why? Because Jesus says, he showed that the dead rise. They're going to live again. There's a resurrection. And so, God can speak of the dead as though they are alive. And that's what we read in Romans 4, 17. On this time of the memorial holiday that we're seeing again this time of year, let's remember that though man forgets, and there's so many things we forget, things that we kick ourselves wishing that we could remember or did remember, our God remembers. He remembers. He knows. He sees all. He hears all. And there's no place we can go where he is not there. We read that in the psalm. Kirby read it for us. If I go to the farthest reaches, across the sea, anywhere, to the highest heights or the lowest depths, thou art there, says the psalmist. Our God, his presence, his knowledge, his power are there. And they're infinite. This is the God we worship. This is the God we believe in. We are not deists. We are theists. We believe in the God of the Bible. And this God is infinite. Praise his name. Our Father in heaven, we worship you this morning. We praise you. For we know that you remember. That you know all things. There is nothing hid from your knowledge. And we're thankful, Father, that this knowledge that you have is not without love. That your love is your great characteristic. That you are love. And that you love us more than we can ever realize. Not because we deserve it, but because you have chosen to bring salvation to those who believe in your Son and who trust him. And Father, we pray that we might not be forgetful of that love, but that we be, may be reminded day by day by the tokens of grace that we see on every hand that you do love us and that you are willing to help us in all the vicissitudes and trials of this life. If only we will look to you in faith and lean upon you, not upon our own understanding, but trust in you. And so, Father, we praise you and we thank you and we worship you and we trust you. We seek to trust you more and we ask you to strengthen our faith and to help whatever unbelief may be present in us. And so we come before you in the name of Jesus and thank you through him. Amen.